afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Spy Coast Farm. Before we get started, okay, I see modesty. Modesty, where's Lisa? She's in the hall. You're at Spy Coast Farm, and if you're not familiar, uh, this is the farm, Lisa Laurie's farm. She had uh, lunch out there with us, and their resident veterinarian is Dr. Modesty Burleson sitting here uh, in the middle. And uh, thank you all for. And here's Lisa. <laughs> I was just thanking you for allowing us to use the space out here for the for the seminar. So thank you. The only thing, if you know any of our team at Hallway Feeds, probably the only thing more dangerous than giving a microphone to Lee Hall is giving one to me. But I made notes. I'll stick to them. I promise. Um, the team at Hallway Feeds is very glad all of you all could join us here today. And I'm going to introduce those of us that are here, uh, people that you might know or work with but maybe only over the phone, and you actually get to put a face with those names. So, Julia Hall, uh, right here is our Vice President of First Impressions. So, if the room looked nice over there, the decorations are good, if you come to the mill and you like the way it looks, that is all Julia Hall, uh, right there. She always looks so good. <laughs> Next to Julia is Mr. Bob Hall. So, Mr. Bob and Miss Bonnie bought hallway feeds back in 1964 and they started all this mess so we're very glad Mr. Bob could join us for lunch today and uh, maybe the seminar or you got farming to do both, both. <laughs> <laughs> that's his prerogative right? Jeff Pendleton's our general manager he's been at hallway feeds uh, for, for over 30 years but he started when he was 10 years old he says yeah he tells folks all the time he doesn't actually work for Mr. Bob Hall. He feels like he works for the U.S. government because of all the paperwork that he fills out for Uncle Sam. <clears throat> Morgan McQuarrie is our Director of Emerging Markets. She's been with Hallway Feeds for over 10 years. She leads our sales team. Uh, we have representatives in Texas, Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and the Mid-Atlantic region. We've, oh, Jared didn't make it today, sorry. Uh, as some of you all have seen on the farm, too, little fevers going around and this and that so we're glad Jared is at home recovering so we have Carly Quinn Carly Gwynn she's hiding behind the camera at the moment she's our director of customer care she just celebrated 10 years at hallway feeds she leads our team of customer customer service specialists uh, to make sure all the delivery logistics are running smoothly and uh, everybody's happy whether that's locally around the country or even our international customers Aubrey Aubrey is our Kentucky equine consultant. She's grown our customer base significantly in markets that we had next to no representation prior to joining our team and this will be, she's coming up on three years in the in the spring. She started a month before COVID hit and um, everybody said stay home but luckily everybody at the farms kept going so thank, thank you all for keeping going so Aubrey could too. Megan and Alex. Megan and Alex is a, a dangerous duo over here combined they make up our technical service team so a lot of you all see them in tandem Megan's been with us over five years almost seven, almost, almost seven years <laughs> maybe more a statement about me than than Megan there uh, almost seven years it was also Megan that did the heavy lifting to make this research possible and today's seminar possible uh, it always wasn't always easy to get was it Megan? not always <laughs> Alex joined our team just over a year ago um, year and a half. It was right towards the end of school, her junior year. Um, we needed her for about a month. Two weeks into that month, we said, what are you doing the rest of the summer? Halfway through the summer, I told Lee and Jeff, we got to keep this one around. So uh, we like having Alex. She assists the technical service, sales, and marketing. Guess what, guys? As of this week, we have TikTok now. Love it or hate it. We can discuss that later, and uh, this is all Alex, so she's posted a video, and you all might be on there today for being here. <laughs> Lee apologizes for not being here today. He, his oldest son is a second-year cadet at West Point. He had the opportunity to go up there and spend time together as a family this week, and so uh, they're together. Uh, I'm Anthony Cook, Director of Sales and Marketing at Hallway Feeds. Just had my 20th anniversary at Hallway, and that was never made more evident than this week and I won't name her because a lot of you all know her, uh, a longtime hallway customer came into the mill and looked at me dead in the eye and said, you know, you always used to look really young, but you just look old now. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> maybe the most honest. I, yeah, I don't know. But never at a loss for words. I told her that I am still really young. We've just hired a really young team behind me. <laughs> so on to what we're talking about today. The research, data, the information presented here has come to fruition through international cooperation between the Hallway Feeds team, primarily Megan, and the team at Kentucky Equine Research, Dr. Pagan, his staff, he's got interns here with us today and part of his team, and Saracen Horse Feeds in the United Kingdom. So some of y'all might be familiar with them and, and what they do in the UK. But we've worked with Saracen for well over 20 years, 21 years. Um, so great, great team we have there. <clears throat> What I hope you take away from today, apart from what's presented to you by Dr. Pagan, is the fact that Hallway Feeds is working for you. It's not about just making a bag of feed for us. That, that's not the point, that's easy. Uh, mixing ingredients together, putting them in a bag is easy. And Jared, if he were here, would tell you that the more robots we introduce to the process, the better we get at making feed quickly, safely, and accurately, and consistently. For us, it's about the why we do it. We want to help you raise the best horses possible. We aim to provide the most nutritionally sound feeds available for use. Our partnership with KER is part of how we make that happen. But having such a knowledgeable team available to you, your ability, uh, them being hands-on in the field, assisting in the research and data gathering, your ability to have access to all the necessary team members at Hallway Feeds are part of what sets us apart. So I'd like to take a moment and thank all the farms that participated in this study as well. It was no small feat for them to contribute. As you watch Dr. Pagan's presentation, consider how much time and effort came from the farms participating with us, weighing horses on a monthly basis, sharing all of their health data with us, sales records, and then looking up equine race records later. Unfortunately, I won't thank any of the farms by name because all the information is confidential. And as promised, no names or identities are ever shared whenever we gather any data like this. So to all those that participated, thank you. Uh, to your horses, your time, your staff, your efforts that start this entire process and make it possible. Dr. Pagan, today we're fortunate to hear from Dr. Pagan with Kentucky Equine Research. He received an MS and PhD degrees from Cornell University in Equine Nutrition and Exercise Physiology. He formed Kentucky Equine Research in 1988 to be an international research, consulting, and product development firm dealing in the areas of equine nutrition and sports medicine. The company's goals are to advance the industry's knowledge of equine nutrition and exercise physiology and apply that knowledge to produce healthier, more athletic horses. KER is actively involved in the thoroughbred industry working with breeders and trainers globally. KER has worked with partnership with Hallway Feeds for over 30 years to provide horsemen in Kentucky and around the world with nutrition solutions for their mares, foals, and racehorses. So we thank Dr. Pagan for being here today. I'm going to let him take it from here and say that at the end of this, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. All right? All righty. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is the mic all right? Okay. A little bit louder. Well, I'll probably end up speaking louder, but um, yeah, th thank you very much for coming. This is amazing to see. This is a really good uh, turnout that, to show that there's interest in, in this area. Um, and also, thanks to Hallway for doing this. I think I'm going to get an echo if we get too much louder than that. And again, uh, Lisa and the crew at uh, Spy Coast, this is an amazing facility. I think it's, it's great that we're able to do it. So I came to Central Kentucky as an equine nutritionist uh, in the mid-1980s. And so I've been here for a long time. From day one, when we were working with farms, trying to uh, develop feeding programs and management programs, the number one priority was skeletal soundness. And one of the things that I was interested in was how growth affects skeletal soundness. So we started to weigh horses. And I, I dug this photo out of the archives. The, the old guys here will certainly, most of you will probably recognize, that's Three Chimneys Stallion Barn. But this skinny guy back here with the dark hair was me, and that's Mark Roberts. And this isn't a big uh, yearling, that's actually Seattle Slough. So that was 1987 when that was taken. So there were measurements of uh, stallions as well as, as yearlings at that point. For those that were around, 
we'll remember the, the famous study that was published from Ohio State about the relationship at that time uh, between dietary minerals and metabolic bone disease, which subsequently was called developmental orthopedic disease. This came out in 1985, and it was really a landmark uh, study because it, it suggested that there was a really important relationship between some minerals that we never even thought much about, copper and zinc, and skeletal soundness. So that was the buzz in the mid 80s when I got here. All of the feed companies immediately adopted these and things got better. There's no doubt that there were some differences in terms of how the, the incidence of certain types of these, these skeletal issues because of that. But the issue didn't go completely away. So we were still interested in what other things besides a sound mineral program led to some of these problems. And again, to tell you that this isn't a problem that we just started about, I found this in the archives as well. This is a magazine cover. Many of you may remember modern horse breeding, those old enough. This became the horse magazine. But this was a round table beating DOD news from the front. And again, a thinner, darker haired me standing there next to uh, an ever handsome Larry Bramblage and Wayne McElwraith. And we were discussing this in 1994 about things that, that were important about feeding young growing horses and the incidence of this problem. And even at that time, I went back and reread the transcript. I was advocating that the, the size of young growing horses and growth was important. And part of the reason I did is we had done a study on a big farm here in central Kentucky, and we weighed and measured their horses over a four-year period. This is 1991 to 94. And we looked at the incidence of OCD. And so when we're talking about these skeletal problems, I'm gonna talk specifically about OCD. There's a lot of other things that can fall into that basket, but, but I'm gonna concentrate on that. On this farm, they had a 10% incidence of surgical OCD. Remember that number. And the sort of the new thing we found was heavier foals, and I'm talking about the first month of age, had more hock and stifle OCD. So this was way back in the early 90s. About that same time, Steve Cadell uh, for, with Hallway created a weighing program, and this was really unique because they started, Steve started to go around, I don't think Megan was born at that point, uh, came around to weigh and measure horses. And this is another nice photo, photos out of the archives. Steve's got his flip phone there, so you can kind of tell from that technology. And that's when mullets were first in fashion. Uh, <laughs> This was actually from Prestonwood Farm, so that'll age it for the old folks here. That was pre-Windstar. Uh, but they started to gather all these data, and it was amazing. We were, we were weighing lots and lots of different foals and gaining a lot of information. We first published some of this, Steve Jackson and, and myself and Steve, back in 1996, and we looked at a group of colts and fillies here in Kentucky. And what we found, something novel to us, uh, stepped out. And that was month of birth made a big difference in how they grew, what the average daily gain was. And you saw that out here at from 10 to 16 months, you got different uh, average daily gain depending on when the foals were born. And that had never been reported before. When we regraph this, instead of months of age here, if we put the month of year, it all made sense. All of that was happening in April. And at the same time, April babies were growing faster as well. So this demonstrated there's a major seasonal effect that was occurring here. Up until that time, we used a data set from Winfields in Canada. It was my major professor, Skip Hintz, that actually did this, uh, this work. They took thousands of weights from Winfields and they developed curves and looked at different genders and whatnot. It was a great curve except when we compared it to what we found in Kentucky, it didn't fit. The way these horses, thoroughbreds were growing in Canada was not the same as here and a lot of it was that seasonal effect. So we started weighing thoroughbreds all over the world. So some of you remember Clarissa Brown Douglas, she still works for us actually in Australia. She spent a year gathering information from all over the world for how, different thorough, how thoroughbreds grow in different parts of the world. 
We started to accumulate so much data that we de developed a software program that would allow us to handle it. It's called GrowTrack. And this allows us to put all the information into a single program, present it graphically back to the breeder, and use some reference curves. We've just uh, kind of gone past the flip phone into the, today's technology, and we're just introducing a new form of this that's cloud-based. And it's, it's really nice technology. You can access it from a web app or from apps on an iPad and whatnot. So those of you who use GrowTrack look forward to this as the next stage of technology because it's, it's really nice te technology that we've developed. And again, we can make it where you can see how an individual animal is growing and look at how it is relative to a specific type of database. One of the problems was with people weighing is what do the weights mean? What are we comparing it to? What are they, are they really telling us much? The other thing we introduced to this software that's real important, and you're gonna to have to get used to this concept because I'm gonna talk about it a lot, are percentiles. So instead of necessarily saying a weight as pounds, we might say as a percentile of the population. So if you take your kid to the pediatrician, they're probably gonna tell you how much it weighs as a percentile of the population. Because there's a bell curve for that population, the median is the 50th percentile, and then you start to go away from that. We now have these growth curves that we can use reference curves for thoroughbreds. So we can talk about percentiles and what that does, it allows us to account for the gender and it allows us to account for the day of age. And so a lot of the stuff I'm gonna show you, I've converted the weight into percentiles. And this is a real important concept because if you look, for instance, a 540 day old filly, which is about the age that you might take it to the sale, the 50th percentile is 990 pounds and the 25th is uh, 944, 75th is 1036. But if that filly had been 570 days, these would have been the numbers. So if you're trying to compare pound for pound without uh, adjusting for the age, you're really, there are big, big differences there and the gender makes a lot of difference too. So a lot of the data that I'm gonna show you is as percentiles. This is kind of the big graph that you have, and this one is the one for colts. So we have days of age down here, and we have the body weight here in pounds. And as you go up, the middle line is the median, but then we have the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. The number of pounds difference that represents depends on how old they are. So when they're babies, that might be plus or minus 20 pounds, but by the time they're up to yearlings, that's 50 pounds difference if you're from the median to one of those outside percentiles. Where do we get the reference curve? We got the reference curve from collecting a hell of a lot of data. This reference curve represents 47,000 thoroughbred folds that we've measured around the world. So it's a really robust set of uh, data and it's all, these are all thoroughbreds. <coughs> Where are they from? More than half of them came from the data that was collected here, but we've thrown in from Australia and New Zealand, from uh, England and Ireland, uh, even a few from India and, and Japan. I'm gonna talk about growth or body size in a bunch of different formats, so we kinda of need to get used to what we're talking about. First of all, there might be percentiles, and so that's that zero to 100 number. You can also represent that, though, as quartiles. And so rather than dividing it into 100 units, you divide it just into four, and it's a little easier to understand. And then there's a bunch of different age ranges. And so what we wanted to do was take this huge database of information that we had and start to ask questions about, does any of this stuff matter? And we looked at it by looking at, it, at the data from a bunch of different perspectives. So one of the main studies that I'm gonna tell you about today is this one here that Anthony alluded to, that Megan and Steve Cadell and Eileen Fithium from, from uh, KER and I put these data together. It included 13 farms, and uh, these are data that was collected between 2014 and 18. That represents 1,400 foals that are in this database. 
for over a thousand of them, we actually got survey radio, uh, radiograph data as well and surgery reports. So this, when I start to talk about OCD, it's from that population. So for that group of horses, we also had growth data, They're the stuff that they collect uh, on a monthly basis, as well as performance data. How well did they sell? How well did they run? We also did the same type of study with a group of horses in England. Uh, and this actually had six farms and 1,700 foals. It was over a longer period of time. And as Anthony mentioned, it was with the company we work with at Hallway and KER works with called Saracen. So we collected basically the same type of data. There's a couple of differences between the two data sets. When Hallway goes out on their weighing program, they'll go to a farm once a month. And so they'll weigh all of the foals there. They won't necessarily weigh at birth. So I'm going to talk a lot about birth weight, but those weights were taken by the farms themselves, and we don't have a complete set of birth weights like we do the other data here. All of the data in Europe was self-collected, and so it's not quite as uniform as the data that we collected here. We wanted to take all these data and make subpopulations that we could start to ask questions. Is there any relationship to how big they are, how fast they grow? And one of it is performance, so we wanted to, to break down uh, starters, winners, stakes winners, graded stakes winners, earnings. I'm going to kind of hone in on stakes winners as a population that we consider that's what we're actually after uh, when we compare it to some other populations. For skeletal disease, the, we got the survey data, radiographic survey data from the farms, again, for this over a thousand foals. This is what took us a massive amount of time to tease through all that data, pull out the incidence of specific problems radiographically, and then we also got the incidence of surgery of those foals, which was actually a little easier and this is reported from the, uh, the, the farms to us, the nature of the surgery, and whether they're OCD surgery, uh, the joint that was represented. There's some other surgeries and some other issues that are also reported uh, in the fetlock fragments and chips and cyst in the stifle, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, later. The other thing we wanted to explore is what other effects really are important for this? And month of birth was a big one. How does when a foal is born affect how it grows and ultimately how much skeletal disease it'll get and how good a racehorse it gets? And then the second one, and I, I honestly didn't think enough about this earlier, is parity. How many foals had that mare had before? And that turns out to be a huge factor, and I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about parity. And I'm, I'm really going to divide into two groups, and I'm, I'm calling maidens, and I don't think that that's really the correct term, it's first foals. It's mares that that foal is the first one the mare had, uh, versus multiparous, where the mares have had foals beforehand. So let's start by looking at birth weight. This is data from 12,000 thoroughbred foals. And this is out of the global, global database, so a lot of it's from here, but it's from other places too. It, this is a, a, a frequency distribution. So we've got the, the different birth weights down here, and then the percentage of each. And you see that they form these bell curves with a couple of little bumps uh, here and there. So the mean birth weight for all of these fillies was 120 pounds. For all of the colts, 122.8, 123. That's for this entire group. When we compared the data we got from England versus the data that we got in Kentucky, that's what this graph is. On the left, in this case, we've got birth weight here. All of those little dots represent a horse or a foal. So this is the birth weight of all of those foals, and there were 700 that we had birth weights on from Kentucky versus UK. And if you look, the average in Kentucky was almost 125 pounds, UK it was closer to 122, and those were significantly different. So that was the first thing we saw. The birth weights in the, the UK group was a little bit smaller 
than in Kentucky. Again, parity was the thing that was really important. And I've taken the number of previous foals that these, these horses had, and this is Kentucky data here. This is from the 1400 that we were talking about, and looked at birth weight. And you can see that once you have three foals, there, it really doesn't make very much difference. And in fact, it didn't even drop off very much if they've had over seven. The biggie is their first one. And there's a really big difference between the, the size of those foals and they're significantly smaller. How much smaller? These are the, the actual data again. And these maidens are about 15 pounds lighter than the multiparous. And so if you look here, there's, there's all of the maiden foals versus the multiparous. And you can see there's a big difference it really makes a difference interpreting our data too. So I've started to try to differentiate what's happening because you've got a maiden and what's happening because of other factors. This is the frequency distribution. Again, this is maidens, that's multiparous. So you can see there's, there's quite a spread between the two. If we look at stakes winners, the ones that we had in this population where we had a birth weight and they won stakes, these are the maidens that won stakes over here. These are the multiparous that won stakes here. And you'll notice on quite a few of these graphs, I've got 100 uh, marked here and 140 at the top. And I'll explain that later, why I've kind of bracketed those two different weights when we're talking about birth weight. But you can see that these are stakes winners here, but the mean for stakes winners for maidens was 114 pounds were multiparous, it was 127. So these are foals that went on and became successful racehorses. They're quite a bit different, but it's because they were out of a, a maiden mare. This is what all of the data looks like. And I told you we did percentiles. Every one of these little dots, that's 1,400 dots for the Kentucky data. These are different age groups. So these are birth weights, uh, one to three months and on up until their yearlings. So that's the individual data, the black lines, the median. These are averages over here. So if we look at, we've got the age of the horses and averages, you see that it doesn't change that much. It's also above 50. Kentucky foals are bigger than the global average. Uh, they're bigger than the reference curve that we have, so they're gonna be over 50 as a group. This is the difference that maidens make though. This time I divided those two groups between the maidens and the multiparous. And you see that maiden mares, their birth weight's only in the 35th percentile compared to the multiparous that's 65. That was that difference of 15 pounds. What I found interesting about this though is as you go across the multiparous, the entire group doesn't really change that much, but the maidens continue to increase. So when they're yearlings, they're 64 versus 53. In pounds, that's about 20 pounds difference. And so the maidens actually catch up quite a bit to the point where there's not a huge difference when they're yearlings compared to when they, they were born. This is when we compared all of the data between Kentucky and UK, and this surprised us quite a bit. There was that difference that we saw in birth weight. This is the average that I've already shown you from Kentucky, but look at UK. For yearlings, the average percentile for these, foal, these yearlings in, uh, raised in UK was 41. That's about 30 to 40 pounds lighter than yearlings in Kentucky depending on, on their age. So there was quite a difference between the, the, the thoroughbreds that are being raised in, in England versus the thoroughbreds that are being raised here. I drilled a little deeper into this and I said, well, what about the elite ones that are being raised? So I went back and I looked at a select group of these yearlings and I picked, there was about 200 per group and I took the top seven stallions from both countries, so you know who those are. Uh, and I looked at those foals specifically, and so these are the elite groups that we looked about at. And you can see the difference was even greater. The, the yearlings that were by elite Kentucky stallions had an average 
percentile of 66 compared to the UK ones that was 39. That's a 40 to 50 pound difference. So there was a big difference in terms of the size of these horses as yearlings. We wanted to see how their sales and racing performance rated relative to their size. And so for these data, I took the, the top 10% of sales prices from the ones that came from Kentucky and the ones that came from UK, and I divided them into quartiles. And this is what we found. This is the US data here. And so these are quartiles. You can see, and the top 10% of these horses was over 436,000. That was the, the, uh, the cutoff for the top 10%. So these are really good yearlings. But you can see that 75% of the yearlings that sold in the US as yearlings were in the third and fourth quartile. They were big, but look at the UK ones. Only 12% of the UK yearlings were in the fourth quartile. The highest was in the second quartile. So these were the ones that sold for the most money, were the ones that were actually lighter. We wondered is, well, this is what they sold for, but how did they race? So we looked at stakes winners out of this group, and we got exactly the same thing. These are stakes winners uh, from the US versus UK. And you can see in the US, it's the same spread that you've got the, the, the most stakes winners were from the fourth quartile as yearlings. And in UK, it was actually the second quartile. So it's the, these data suggest that we're really looking at kind of different horses at that point. If we look at the top 10% of earnings, not stakes winners now, but the top in, in earnings, we see that for the US, again, it's in the fourth quartile. Uh, the ones, the heavy yearlings were the ones that earned the most money, but in UK it was the second quartile. If we look though at height, Withers height, they're both in the third quartile. So it, it, was, it seems like the height of the yearlings that were the most successful were not different, but the weights were different. And kind of the sweet spot for the UK horses were second quartile for body weight, third for withers height, fourth quartile for, uh, for body weight for um, the Kentucky yearlings, and again, third quartile for withers height. So we wondered, uh, they seem to be different, but have they always been different? Or are yearlings in Kentucky getting bigger? Are we actually breeding and raising a bigger yearling now than before? So I went back into this big database and we looked at the yearling size of yearlings that we had been measuring since the early 2000s. And we took about 4,200 yearlings over an 18 year period and looked at the, their size when they were in August or September, the weight before they went to the sales. And when we did a linear regression, what we found was, yes, they are getting bigger, at least the ones we are weighing. And that uh, equates to about the ones that we're weighing right now are about 20 pounds heavier than the ones that were being weighed back in the early 2000s. But when we looked at Withers height, it didn't change. So they were the same height the entire time, but they become 20 pounds heavier. This is a frequency distribution of four crops from 2020, uh, 2002 to 2005. So that's about a thousand yearlings compared to a thousand yearlings more recently. And you can see that they it has actually moved to the right. Now interpreting this, this is not the exact same farms that were being measured in 2000 in the early 2000s and now. There are new farms that have entered the program, so whether that has something to do with it is, uh, is certainly debatable. What about month of birth? This is the distribution of the data that we had for the different horses. This is the percentage of foals born in January, February, March, April, and May in the UK versus the US. And in our data set, it looked like the U.S. horses tended to be skewed a little bit more towards uh, later births than previous. 
If we looked at just Kentucky foals and the size of those foals born in January, February, March, April, and May, you see there's this stair step up. So there's a big difference between how big the foals are when they're born in each of these. Some of that effect though is the maiden effect. Because if we look at the percentage of maidens that were in each of these months, when do you have maiden, when do you fold most of your maiden mares? January and February is when they were more predominant. So if you split that out, you see that the size of the maidens, regardless of when they're born, doesn't really make a lot of difference. May is kind of a weird one, but that there was very few maidens that are actually born then. If you look at multiparous though, there still is a month effect that they are getting bigger the older they are, the later in the year. If we try to equate this with performance and look at stakes winners, February was the highest in terms of the percentage of stakes winners of this group. Out of 24% of the total population, 35% of the stakes winners. That's in America. This is in England, so the same thing happened. That February foals tended to win more stakes winners than a proportion of the, the foals that they were. And if you do it as a percent stakes winners for the horses born there again, that February was overrepresented. So let's turn now and talk about OCD and body weight. Is there a relationship? Again, the way that we measured this is we had one group of foals that did not have OCD. <coughs> they didn't have OCD in a survey report. They didn't have uh, OCD surgery. Then from the sur surveys and surgery, we looked at uh, OCDs that occurred in fetlock, hock, and stifle, and these other issues as well. When we were reporting lesions that occurred in the stifle, there's two different distinct uh, regions and there are different types of problems that occur predominantly. Most of the OCD occurs in the lateral trochlear ridge of the stifle, and those are reported as OCD surgery and they have surgery. The cysts tend to occur in the medial femoral condyle. It's a different part of the joint, and we're treating these as completely different types of problems. Uh, these are treated surgically. These are kind of a combo of medical and, and surgical. Uh, it, radiographically, the, the lesions in the medial femoral condyle also go from kind of the shallow lucency to, to clear down to sclerosis, deep sclerosis, and subchondral cysts. So as severity changes, the way that they're described is, is changed. I'm going to talk specifically about subchondral cyst and some the combination of deep sclerosis and cyst. There's a lot of surgery that occurs in the fetlock also that we're not classifying as OCD. And one of the things that's interesting, one is if you look at maidens versus multiparous, there's a difference. The maidens had fewer of these fetlock surgeries. A lot of these surgeries are for chips, and that's the blue part up here. There's another group that are described as fragments, and fragments may or may not be OCD. That's kind of controversial. We didn't include them in the stats for OCD. We only included fetlock OCD if it was called OCD by the, the surgeon. This is the surgical incidence of OCD in this Kentucky group uh, listed by the joint that was affected. And overall 10%, remember that number, that was in our 1990 uh, study, that was the percent incidence. So that was the overall incidence. Two things stick out to me here. Look at the incidence out of maiden mares and specifically look at the incidence of lateral trochlear ridge stifles. There's not very many. And when we compared this to the data from England, the same thing happened. In the US, the, the maidens only had a 0.7% incidence of surgical lateral trochlear ridge stifles, 2.7 uh, for multiparous. Exactly the same thing happened in UK. The same incidence of stifle surgery, but the maidens were less. And if you look at foals out of maiden marriage, have about 35% less total OCD, 
and 70% less stifle OCD. So that was an interesting finding. I don't know if that's been ever, that question's ever been asked before. When we looked at how these different OCD surgeries related to ultimate racing success, one of the main questions is, did they race at all? And if we look at horses in this population that didn't have OCD at all, 22 did not race, and we don't know the reason why they were unraced. If we look at the ones that were reported as Hock or Fetlock OCD surgery, they weren't any higher. In fact, they were a little bit lower. Those weren't statistically different. In our study, the lesions that, that seemed to have the biggest effect on racing were in the stifle. Whether it was OCD surgery, the lateral trochlear ridge, or whether they were these cysts, about a third of those didn't race. When we looked at age to first start, though, there wasn't any difference in this population. Um, these are the horses that had surgical OCD. This is their percentile of weight at different ages. This is 108 different folds. So that's a, it's a pretty big database. And you see that that doesn't really change. Their average weight doesn't change very much. But if you remember those other data that I was talking about, they were 58, not 68. So if you look at relative to horses that did not have OCD surgery, early on, birth weight in the first three months, the ones that had OCD surgery were a lot bigger. That was and highly statistically different, those horses. But later, they didn't, they weren't different. This is comparing no OCD to OCD surgery. This is comparing stakes winners to OCD surgery. So horses that ended up winning stakes, you can see started significantly lower birth weights and during the first three months were also lower. But you see that these horses ended up as big yearlings. And I've already showed you that, that the ones that are successful as yearlings are in fourth quartile. But they didn't start there. And that's an important finding that we had. They didn't necessarily start as great big foals. They ended up as big yearlings. If we drill into this a little bit more, and now we just look at weights that were taken during the first 30 days of life. They were either a birth weight or sometime during the first 30 days. This is what no OCD looks like. So these are quartiles, and they're kind of evenly distributed, so it's sort of uh, in the bell curve. If you look at horses that won stakes, the, predominantly they were in the third quartile at that age. If you looked at the horses that ended up having OCD surgery, they were predominantly in the fourth quartile. And this is one to 30 days of age. So that's something that I think is important to, to remember. These same horses, so this you see that these stakes winners were in, uh, higher in the third quartile, these were higher in the fourth quartile. That's the first weight that was taken, the first month. What did these horses, these exact same horses do when they were yearlings? That's what they look like as yearlings. And there's absolutely no difference. The ones that won stakes look just like the ones that uh, had OCD surgery. So if you tried to look at just their weight as yearlings, you'd go, there's no relationship at all. They're exactly the same. But if you look at those same horses the first 30 days, they're different. This is stakes winners versus OCD surgery birth weight. So you can see that the majority of the stakes winners, their birth weights were in between 140 and 100. If you see OCD surgery, you see that there starts to be a little higher uh, incidence in birth weight. This is the incidence of OCD surgery by month of birth. And what we see is April is overrepresented for multiparous horses. So this is an interesting comparison. We wanted to then take a maiden mare away from a multiparous mare because, or a foal because they, they grow differently. They are different when they're born and they grow differently. In this case, I'm going to look first at just maidens. So these are only foals that are out of mares that this is their first foal. On the left is what this looks like for no OCD. Maidens are small, so you see that 
75% of the maidens are below the median for the entire population. But the ones that have OCD, you see that the majority are in the third quartile. So you see that they're overrepresented. And this is, again, during the first 30 days. This is what multiparous looks like. Multiparous mares have bigger folds anyway, so there's a higher percentage in the third and fourth, but you see here that they're even more represented if they have OCD surgery. So I found this very interesting, that that's the way that a maiden looks versus multiparous in terms of the distribution. Uh, but bo in both instances, the ones that had surgery are bigger, but the maidens are not necessarily completely up to the fourth quartile. And this is really interesting too. This is that frequency distribution I talked about before. This is for stakes winners. So we made a population that these foals ended up winning stakes later in life. This are the maidens and these are the multiparous. And there's 20 maidens and 35 multiparous on this graph. So you see these are the ones, the maidens, and these are multiparous. That looks very much like the total population. How does that compare to stakes winners compared to horses that ended up with OCD surgery? This is what maidens look like. So if you look at, this again are, is the frequency distribution for stakes winners. This is the frequency distribution if they had OCD surgery. And the median here is 112 versus 125. So the maidens that ended up having OCD surgery were bigger at birth than the ones that ended up being stakes winners. So I think the bottom line is when you have a 112 pound foal, make sure you see whether it's a maiden or not because that's not such a bad thing for this. If you look at multiparous, you see that these are the ones that ended up winning stakes and the ones that had OCD surgery, here they're overrepresented in this higher weight. So again, if we go back and we look at these different populations and we say, are they different? You can do a, a risk assessment. You can see if they're exposed to something, and in this case, if they're bigger than 139 pounds when they're born, do they have a higher probability of having OCD? Do they have a higher probability of winning a stakes? Well, when we did that analysis on birth weight, those that were more than 139 pounds when they were born were twice as likely to have OCD surgery. And a third as likely to be stakes winners. So again, this is part of where these bumpers started to come. If we look at the entire month, not just the birth weight, but any weight that was taken then, you can see that no OCD and stakes winners look the same. They're both about average size foals, but the ones that ended up having OCD were bigger. And that 139 pound number I gave you would equate to being in the 90th percentile during the first month. So they're big foals, but you see that they're twice as likely to have OCD. And it didn't seem to matter in this what joint you were talking about for OCD, whether it was a stifle hock or fetlock. And again, these are data showing the, fet, the, the stifle and if uh, you have a higher uh, risk ratio if, if they're bigger than the median. When we looked at the ones that had medial femoral condyle cyst, they were not like the ones that had lateral trochlear ridge problems. They looked like the regular population. So this big foal thing and the cyst didn't seem to uh, continue. It was the ones that ended up with OCD where it was the bigger ones that ended up having the problem. So if you look specifically in the stifle, it seems like the lateral trochlear ridge ones are more related to body weight than the medial femoral condyle. So what about month of birth? What we found was the incidence of OCD in Kentucky, the highest month for having OCD was April. And in the UK, it was May. Uh, so this is the incidence of radiographic OCD by joint in the US. 
and you can see May is much higher than foals that were born in February. Uh, if you look at the incidence of surgery, where the foals not only had a radiographic incidence, but they, were, uh, they operated them, you can see again, twice as many that were uh, foaled in April had OCD surgery compared to foals that were born in February. And so, from these data, February looks like a pretty good month to have a foal in Kentucky. You're overrepresented by stakes winners, underrepresented by the incidence of stifle lesions, where April, not so much. But if you have a foal in February that's big, the foals that had OCD surgery out of multiparous mares that were born in February, they were all big. So there's, there's a difference there. The other interesting thing between Kentucky and UK is there was a lot more stifle, the reported stifle surgery in Kentucky compared to UK. The incidence was 6% compared to 2.6. And uh, again, a lot of that was in March and April. Fortunately, in this group, those that had hock surgery weren't really dinged at the sale and they turned out to be just as good a racehorses. So these that had hock OCD surgery, that wasn't as big of an issue. So this is really strange. Why is it that we're concentrating on this weight the first 30 days to predict these, these problems that you're seeing in radiographs when the foals are 300 to 330 days, and they're operated a year later. What could be the reason? It could be related to how bone grows. And so a possibility is if you look at undeveloped bone, fetal bone, most of it is cartilage. There's a central level of, of ossification. It goes down as the bone develops. There's a secondary center of ossification. Eventually, that replaces the cartilage and you're left with just articular cartilage. And so during this time though, is when this developmental time, there could be these issues occurring. And there's a group in Scandinavia, in Norway, that's been studying this for a long time. They started studying it in, in pigs. And osteochondrosis is actually a bigger problem in pigs than it is in horses. And what they have brought forward from good, really good data, both from swine and from horses, is that part of the, the reason that horses develop osteochondrosis early is because of a disruption in blood supply in the cartilage early. So these are slides from this, the, the, uh, some review papers that these guys have done. But if you look early at cartilage, there's a lot of uh, vasculature within the cartilage at the end of the growing bone. This is cartilage, this is bone here. This gradually grows down and replaces the cartilage. And so as it grows, this, these, uh, this vascular connects with this vascular. And what this group maintains is if there's damage to these blood vessels when that's occurring, that this could lead to a problem of osteochondrosis. It can repair itself though, or if it doesn't repair itself, then this cartilage gets retained in this, this, this front of bone, and eventually if, a, if it breaks off, then that becomes osteochondrosis. So what they say is that very early on when there's all this vascular, if it's injured, that that can lead eventually to an osteochondrotic lesion. So the, the insult may have happened pretty early. It may resolve itself, but if it doesn't resolve itself, it ends up with OCD that you would see in a radiograph or that you would see in surgery. So there may be a much earlier onset of this than we originally thought that is being picked up in these radiographs later. So the, the question is, is there anything that you can do about resolution and repair of this uh, 
before it becomes OCD. Well, there's a lot of things that could potentially lead to OCD. We know that heredity, confirmation, the, uh, the environment, nutrition, but also it looks like body weight early on may contribute to this problem. We've already seen that seasonally, the ones that are born later seem to have a lot more OCD. We also know there's a big seasonal effect that occurs in growth at that point. Not only is the seasonal effect occurring in yearlings, it's occurring in lactating mares and young foals. We did a big study where we looked at almost 4,000 mares and foals and how they were growing related to the month that they were foaled. And what we found was that mares that are foaled in January and February actually lose weight during the first month of lactation and then they start to gain weight later. And if you look at when that occurs, it occurs, that weight gain occurs when spring pasture occurs. And so this spring pasture has a very large effect on the nutrient intake that lactating mares have. And as the spring comes and the temperature gets greater, the grass grows, and these mares actually start to gain weight during lactation. And this has a knock-on effect to their foals. If we look at the body weight gain of these individual foals, we see that the ones that are born earlier have lower average daily gains early. So from that study, the foal body weights correlated to the mare body weight and average daily gain is correlated to the mare average daily gain. So foals that are born to mares that are gaining a lot of weight later in the year grow faster. Heavier mares produce heavier foals and faster growing foals are for mares that are gaining weight. And we know that January and February foals are smaller at birth and they grow slower. And so this might, some of this is certainly de uh, described by uh, the, this maiden effect, these smaller mares, but there's also certainly a seasonal effect. So from all of these data combined, what can we take home? What are the conclusions that we have? Well, my conclusion is that osteochondrosis may actually begin a lot earlier than we thought. It may be more related to how big the foal is during the early months of life as opposed to how big they are later in life. Uh, it's highly correlated with birth weight and those first weights. Uh, and one per, uh, possible explanation is this disruption in blood flow that may have occurred. We know that stifle problems are important both from sales and racing performance. It looks like the lateral trochlear ridge problems are more related to body weight. And that, if you, if you accept that this disruption of blood flow might be part of the problem, that might explain this difference because of the orientation of those blood vessels when this could potentially occur. We know Kentucky uh, yearlings in this study, in these two studies, had more HOC OCD. Uh, it wasn't as detrimental as stifles at sales, uh, but it's it, it's it's interesting to wonder if that's if this is because of the difference in the size of these yearlings and the conformation of the American dirt horse that has been bred now. We know that maidens are smaller and they have less OCD. Is that why they have less OCD? Because they're smaller? We don't know. So what do we do about it? How do we manage this? Well again, I've put up these bumpers and you know, 140 is somewhat arbitrary, but I would maintain that if you have foals that are larger than 140 pounds or larger than 130 pounds at birth, they're at higher risk than horses, foals that are born uh, smaller than that. So how do you manage it? Well, measure it first. Find out what are these weights and identify them as high risk. Do those foals need to be cared for differently? Do they need to be managed both in terms of activity and exercise than those that are lower? What I think this data conclusively shows is that small foals 
are more resilient than larger foals in terms of OCD. They're less likely to get OCD. These larger foals, I think you need to, uh, you need to pay more attention to. Do we need to be looking for these lesions earlier? Rather than a spring survey, is there any uh, utility to potentially x-raying these big foals in the fall to see if they are more su susceptible? And a big question is, can we feed and manage these foals to resolve those lesions before they're seen in a, in a spring survey? In the swine data, they say 60 to 70 percent of the OCD resolves before it ever becomes a lesion. So that's an important consideration. Is there something that we could have done earlier? Certainly, I think, in terms of a management tool, the thing that we can do most is appreciate how important grass is in Kentucky and how important it is to a lactating mare's total feed intake and probably be more cognizant of how it's contributing compared to the hard feed that you're using and uh, whether we can adjust the extra calories that we're giving to these mares to reduce this type of excess energy intake. So that's something that I think from a management tool uh, uh, perspective is probably worth considering. One of the things that we're going to do in the future with all of the data that we're collecting in Kentucky is we're going to generate monthly reports for the farms that are weighing their horses. And we're going to tell the farms how are their foals growing this year compared to the historical information and how is the whole region growing this year compared to the historical. Because we all know that there, the climate is, is becoming more variable, there are differences in how uh, it's affecting our pasture growth and it's probably affecting the foal growth as well. Because we've transferred this now over to this new technology, it'll be easier for us to actually make those measurements and give farms some heads up that yes, this is actually coming that there are differences in the way that they're growing, which means that there, there probably needs to be some sort of modifications done in terms of the additional feed that they're getting, and hopefully that can help to dissuade some of this. So I'd, I'd, I'd leave you with this. I've thrown a lot of this at you in a very short period of time, but if you take anything uh, at, at all from this, I think that the, uh, the size of foals is important. I think it's important to measure this and to understand how we can modify that through management and through nutrition and hopefully we can help head off some of these problems. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Pagan. Before we get to questions, Julia asked for a favor. Uh, if you could pass your coffee cups down or to the end, hallway team, if you could grab those and run them to the caterer, they would very much appreciate that. While they're, uh, while they're gathering, Dr. Pagan can take a drink and we'll see if there's any questions uh, for Dr. Pagan. You explained it perfectly. <laughs> yes, modesty. Have you looked at wobbler disease that looks like those guys are born? If it's like a March April with a steep growth curve? We have not. Wobblers was not included in the, that list of, of DOD. So no, unfortunately, I don't have those data to see how that was related. We got Dr. Bailey over here on the side. Dr. Bailey, that was beautiful. Thank you very much for putting all that together. I know how much time and effort that takes. Did you look at um, the relationship between gestational age at foaling and any of your parameters? Because obviously, say that when, multi paras mares that pull in January are more likely to be pulling prematurely. Yeah, right. The mares that pull in May or April may or may be beyond their gestational age. That's an excellent point. And no, we didn't. Uh, one of the things that we're adding to this database now is estimated length of gestation. 
And when we started doing that, we didn't add that. And so trying to reconstruct that has become very time consuming. But I suspect you're exactly right that that's going to be another piece of the puzzle is how long was the gestational age. Just as, like I say, the last time that I gave this, I didn't pay as much attention to uh, the parity at all. And it's a hugely important factor. So yeah, that's prospectively as we're going forward, we are calculating that from breeding dates and foaling dates and hopefully we, we can shed a little light on that. It, it used to be all Megan asked for was uh, a name, any name for the horse so we can keep track of it and grow track and we need a foaling date and sex. Well, we're going to have a whole form just like going to the doctor's office pretty soon, I think, with, <laughs> with all the information, anything to add. But it's, it's all use. Every time you do this, you have more questions than you ever do answers. Are there other questions, Dr. Spike? <laughs> Debbie, I thought we weren't supposed to talk about sesamoiditis. <laughs> it, it, it's massively confusing. In the, the, I didn't, and I purposely left that hot potato on the stove. Um, we have data from the surveys about sesamoiditis, both the spring and if they were presented at sale. Our problem with us trying to um, make heads or tails of that is most of the descriptions are not very precise about the severity of the sesamoiditis. And between, these data came from a bunch of, Rude and Riddle for obviously a lot, but there were a lot of different vet clinics submitting this. And about 25% of the foals had some indication of sesamoiditis. If we lump, and not very many had adjectives describing sesamoiditis as being severe or even moderate. You know, most of it was just described as either sesamoiditis or mild sesamoiditis, or I think you'd be like slight sesamoiditis. Uh, so we have analyzed that. Uh, again, because we can't really put it into the correct subpopulations, I didn't want to make it, and plus that's a massive amount of stuff without sesamoiditis. My general impression, though, is the horses, the foals that get sesamoiditis are not the same ones that have OCD, that they seem to be pretty two different populations. And if anything, those foals tend to be a little behind early. And I'm thinking that some of the sesamoiditis might be some, some compensatory stuff later and even compensatory during sales prepping. That if the foals get to that point where they have not got, gotten to the kind of size that they have and they're pushed a bit, that was my general impression. But again, because we don't really have very, a very precise way to describe it, I haven't put it here and we're not going to publish that. Uh, Troy. Um, you talk about the OCD surgery. Did you look into any of the screw implants that they put in the OCDs in the stifle? Well, yeah, so, and, and <laughs> probably I'll punt that one off to Debbie too, but the OCD surgery, that's why I did lateral trochlear ridge, that it's OCD, it is an OCD lesion. The cysts, the things that are mat, the medial femoral condyle, um, it's a different type of surgery and it seems like it keeps changing. So even across our fairly short period of time, the way that those lesions were treated, I, I just saw that they're, you know, using the, the screws and whatnot for that. Seems to be in vogue now. I'll let you speak to that. Um, but it, it seems like we had a whole hodgepodge of ways that those were actually treated. There was just a paper at AAP from Texas, I think, about that procedure and its, its success. But again, that's... But I think from your data, it, the, it, that's before really the time when people were, were putting screws in. Yeah. So I don't think we probably really have that subset yet. Yeah, so it, it seemed to be a really evolving treatment for that specific lesion. And so... At this group, too, the incidence of, of cysts that were reported here were fairly low, actually. It was about 1% that were subchondral cysts. So that's actually, I think, you know, for, as a, 
uh, would be less than probably would have been considered um, normal. All the way in the back, Catherine. Kathy. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, this this does not supersede any of the recommendations on mineral nutrition. I think that absolutely providing the right substrates uh, for skeletal development or so that the foal is born with those, we still recommend, we still do. Uh, I think what we're trying to get at is sort of what is causing some of the problems that still occur even when you did that? You know, that's kind of the next step. But by all means, we think that you need to, to feed uh, adequate trace minerals during, during late pregnancy, for sure. One, one question, just in your observations on the North American population, it seems that the bigger horses are resulting in the stakes winners. Is that a correct? Yeah. Is that because... Well, now, there was a higher proportion. There are some stakes winners and successful stallions that were tiny foals and even yearlings. So, I mean, we shouldn't generalize that it's only, you know, big. But statistically, there were more big yearlings win stakes than smaller ones. And is that because the bigger horses are just better athletes or because the breed is bigger on the whole and so more I think there's a phenotype that that has been genetically selected for those bigger horses for racing in the US uh, so I think there are yeah it's a that that's the phenotype that's that's desirable uh, where the the turf horse the English turf horse it's a different phenotype than the, these horses, and it, it it clearly showed itself in those two uh, data sets that they're they're definitely different in terms of their size as yearlings. When Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. The number of horses that were not sold was similar between the two populations. But not sold contains two different groups. One is they were homebreds that they wanted to keep in race, and the other was not good enough to sell. You know, so we couldn't really differentiate those, but the percentage of those that were not presented for sale was very similar between these two. And these, the, the farms that participated in both studies were very similar in terms of, I'd say, the quality of the horses. And, uh, you know, if you looked at the, the average, or well, the top 10% of sales price and all of that, they, it, it was a nice match between the two. Both populations were better than average, though. They were, I would, I would say these were elite populations of farms. I would guess that if you went across all farms and you got to the lower end, you wouldn't see the same sort of differences in size. Um, but these, these were very good farms and produced, I mean, the you know, percent stakes winners and whatnot was quite high and, and consistent between the two. That, that's a really good thing to point out because farms that take their time to weigh their horses, to track this growth, to share that information. Not always, but th they're operating kind of at a different place. <laughs> yeah, so it's a biased demographic because it was farms that cared enough to, you know, to, to do all of that. So it, 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 I don't know that you can extrapolate this across the entire population of, of thoroughbreds. And on that note of weighing, <laughs> And I'm not going to look at Megan and Alex for the dirty looks they're going to give me because they weigh over 2,400 horses a month as is right now. We've got plenty of time to weigh more. There's two of them. They can split up and go, <laughs> go to different places. We can get that to 4,800 easy. We would like to get more birth weights, and that actually comes uh, from well, you all. And that's a good point because when Megan and Alex go out, they're not going to get birth weights because they're not going to go into folding barns because there's biosecurity stuff. And we would 
based on our data particularly, we would really encourage everybody taking a birth weight. I think that, that these data show me that that's a very important number that, that you should have, which means you're going to have to have your own scale, but you can get you know less expensive scales if you're just doing birth Yeah, weights. You, you can get small animal vet office scales for, for folding weights. They're not two foot wide, three foot long. <coughs> I don't remember the last time we priced it, but that's something you keep in the folding barn or wherever you're folding. And, what your, so your time frame there for birth weight is different. If you notice, you had birth weight and you had one to 30 days. So day one is not birth weight. Birth weight is within... Well, no, I, so glad you did that. For the, whenever I showed you those data, so we didn't go through millions of slides, is if I showed you data that was one to 30, we had birth weight as one of those. So if they had a birth weight and another weight, it was it, those two were taken for that individual fold. There is kind of a question about when is birth weight birth weight? You know, how many hours after foaling is it still considered a birth weight? And you know, foals during early growth are gaining, you know, three or four pounds a day. So there's taking a weight three days later is very different than taking one within. We're defining it as within 24 hours of when they foal. And we honestly have a lot more data from other countries than we do here. We've got great data from Australia on birth weights. They take lots of that in England and Ireland, a lot of birth weight stuff. It'd be nice if we had more of that, that data here. So that being said, there's plenty of time in their calendars and smile not, right ladies? Mm -hmm. <laughs> plenty of time to, uh, we'll help you anything past that birth weight, but we need you all to get the birth weights. But uh, yeah, we'd love to come out and wait. Lisa? I just suggest if you're going to do that, you calibrate with yours. I know that we have some differences, yes. right, with our scales and your scales, so uh, just take the time to do that. And that's a good point. I mean, the, the data that I showed you that's from the weighing program is with the same scale, the same technicians doing it. It's really clean data. When, you, when it's self-taken and with a different scale, that might introduce some, some variability. And I won't point anybody out, but if you're doing a heart girth measurement, it won't be included in yeah. here. <laughs> it's only actual, actual scale data that's involved. Conrad, you have a question? Sorry, I thought I saw you. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank everybody. Uh, thank all of you all for coming today. Um, hope you enjoyed it. You can certainly uh, ask Dr. Pagan any questions you have on your way out or follow up with any of our team. You all laid out hats. There's still some hats. If you, if you didn't grab yours off the table, grab it on your way out and a, and a few pamphlets over there as well. But if you need anything from the hallway team or KER, please stop and ask any of us. But thank you all. Thank everybody for coming. If we don't see you, Merry Christmas. Thank you.